good morning. Thank you guys for tuning in. You've reached the Real Estate Fix with Rich on KHTS, your hometown station. It's eight minutes after 10 on Friday morning, first Friday of the month, so that means it's time for us to do the show. Thank you guys for tuning in. Happy New Year to everybody listening. It's, I think 2024 is going to be a, really ter- a terrific year. It's got to be better than 2023. Uh, so I've got a lot of good stuff on the horizon. Uh, but today we're going to change the show around just a little bit because um, those of you who uh, listen to the show regularly or follow what we do regularly at the office um, know that uh, over the holiday between Christmas and New Year's, we had a little bit of excitement dealing with the uh, the Howards, the story of the uh, 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 retired Marine with uh, ALS out in Simi Valley who uh, SLS is foreclosing on a zombie second. And I was lucky enough to get to talk about Zombie Seconds um, on, on Fox 11, which was very nice of them to have me on their, their um, newscast. And that, uh, that uh, little bit, that little five or six minutes, seems to have gotten some people's attention uh, because I'm getting asked to do other things and other networks and things, which is nice. But most importantly, uh, we're getting a response from SLS, or I should say SLS's new parent company because they were just bought. Uh, and it looks like the foreclosure for the Howards has now been paused. Uh, so media attention does work. When you guys respond, when you watch, when you comment, when you go on the internet and you respond to these things, it works. It has an effect. So we have not saved their house yet. Uh, the house still has a pending notice of default against it. They haven't quashed the uh, the lawsuit yet, but they have told us that they are pausing the foreclosure. So at least we bought them some more room and we'll see what else we can do with that. And I'll update you as we go. So thank you guys for those of you who watch and for those of you who listen. I really do appreciate it. And thank you for, for commenting on the internet and liking and subscribing and all that other fun stuff we do on the internet these days because it makes a difference. And in this case, it's like I said, we're not quite there yet, but in this case, we're well on our way to saving the Howard's house. So thank you guys all for that very, very much. Uh, but today, so we're going to talk today primarily about zombie mortgages, what they are, how they are, how we get rid of them, how we fight them, because uh, they're dangerous and they're getting worse. Uh, just in the last week, the number of zombie mortgage cases we have in my office alone has doubled. Uh, that's a lot in a week. I don't know if people are waiting to come back from the holidays. Or the banks were just nailing people with notices of default here the first week of the year. I couldn't really tell you what, what motivated it. Maybe it was showing up on Fox, but we're getting a lot more of them. So we're going to talk about zombie mortgages today. But first, a bit of fun before we get into the zombie mortgage stuff, which is a bit more serious. We're going to do, uh, as you guys know, I like to do a segment called Bad Bank of the Week. Uh, and there, there are certain players who show up repeatedly on Bad Bank of the Week, but we're going to do a special one now. We're going to do one called Bad Bank of the Year, being the new year. So uh, we had a couple of, of nominees for Bad Bank of the Year 2023. Uh, PHH always gets an honorable mention for Bad Bank because they're horrible. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, uh, who else? SLS, of course, always on the list. They're always in the hunt for Bad Bank of the Year. But this year, the award has to go to, there was one clear winner, and thank you to Stephanie on my staff for helping me put this together. Uh, there's one clear winner this year for Bad Bank of the Year. It, there could be no other. Uh, after going through it, looking at the various situations, there was just one bank. I would like to say rose to the top, but maybe sank to the bottom is, is more accurate, accurate description. There's one bank that has sunk to the bottom, that has embarrassed themselves and the mortgage industry, and has treated their own clientele so poorly, so unbelievably, unimaginably poorly, whose behavior is so inconsistent and so frankly pathetic, and if I said embarrassing, let's say it again, embarrassing, and the winner is Gregory Funding. Gregory Funding is a bank uh, out of uh, Oregon, and they're awful. They're absolutely awful. They think they're beating the mortgage industry, the mortgage system, and making themselves more profitable by having far fewer humans involved. And uh, God bless the, the internet and God bless AI, but it is not capable of running a mortgage company yet. So let's talk about Gregory Funding and why we give them the, gave them a bad bank of the year. Gregory Funding boasts revenue of $17.5 million a year. They service approximately 25,000 loans, approximately $5 billion in mortgages. And here's the impressive part with Gregory Funding, and they're very proud of this, I think, don't think they should be. Gregory Funding has 31 employees. Let that sink in for a minute. 25,000 loans, $5 billion in mortgages, 31 employees. If you do a little quick math, what that'll tell you is that each one of these employees has to be personally responsible for 806 loans. And that's if every one of these employees is working in customer service. The average bank has about 3 to 5% of their, their workforce working in customer service, the average mortgage bank, that is. Uh, Gregory Funding, even if we say 20%, let's give them a credit, let's say 20% of their entire workforce is in customer service. That's six people. And I don't think it's that many. When you call Gregory Funding, if you are a, if you are unfortunate enough to have a loan with Gregory Funding, and you didn't pick that loan, Gregory Funding buys them in the secondary market. Your loan may have started with somebody reputable and now has wound up just because of bad luck or bad timing with Gregory Funding. If you call into Gregory Funding's customer service because you have a problem, you will be on hold for four to six hours on average. 
four to six hours on average just to get someone on the phone. And it's no better when you try to talk to them online. They're supposed to be a big online company, but they don't respond to emails. It is the most ridiculous thing you've ever seen. The Better Business Bureau agrees with me. I didn't know you could have this. They have an F minus rating. I thought F was F. But apparently, Gregory Funding has an F minus. Maybe I'm just thinking, maybe, I'm just, maybe I added the minus myself. I don't know. But either way, they deserve an F minus if they don't already have one. I think they actually have an F minus. They're horrible. They average 43 Better Business, Compu- Better Business Bureau complaints per year. That's over four and a half a month. That's, that's ridiculous. No reputable bank has that. Even Wells Fargo, which gets caught with scandal after scandal that makes major news, they don't have a Better Business Bureau rating of an F. They don't have 43 Better Business Bureau complaints per month. Uh, so Gregory Funding, I got to hand it to you guys. In a very crowded field, you guys win Bad Bank of the Year 2023. I think we'll get an award made and send it to you because I don't know that's something you should be proud of, but you should be aware. Uh, and for those of you who have Gregory Funding, who are, ha- who are so unfortunate as to be crippled by this horrible bank, I have some good news for you because I'm always looking for solutions. That's why we call it the Real Estate Fix. Uh, I have a, I've, I've worked out a deal with a local lender that they will do a refinance for you at cost if you have a Gregory Funding loan. Now, you still want to make sure, you, you know, the interest rate, because probably you have a loan that's a couple of years old, it's probably going to be a lower interest rate. So we can't do anything about that. But uh, Sam at, at the Mortgage Hub has volunteered to do uh, loans for anyone who's got a Gregory Funding mortgage at cost, which is very generous of him to do that because he knows, just like I do, that Gregory Funding is awful. And also, it can't guarantee that if you get a new loan, you won't end up back there uh, because, like I said, they buy them in the secondary market and you can't prevent a bank from selling your loan to another bank which we're going to talk a little bit about with zombie mortgages. Uh, it's just one of those things and one of the laws in, in the state of California that we have to put up with. Uh, it's kind of a national thing, but it's just silly, but it's just the way it works. So yeah, so if you have Gregory Funding, if you're if you are in the unfortunate, unenvious position of having Gregory Funding as your mortgage bank, uh, we have a deal for you. You can call me anytime. I give my number out all the time, 661-714-1400. Again, 661-714-1400. That is my personal cell phone. You can call me or text me on that anytime. And if you have Gregory Funding, please give me a call. I'll be more than happy to help you either get away from them or at the very least get you into a better position so you can keep an eye on them because they're wholly untrustworthy, which is never something you want to be able to say about a bank. But Gregory Funding is wholly untrustworthy. Whether it's because of incompetence or maliciousness, I couldn't really tell you, but the result is the same. They are the 2023 Bad Bank of the Year. So congratulations to Gregory Funding. Wish we had some fanfare for them. We'll have to work on special effects next year. Uh, also an honorable mention, because whenever you have an award like this, you should have an honorable mention. Uh, in general, I like credit unions. I find credit unions to be more responsive. I do a lot of stuff, my stuff personally with Logix. I think they're very good at this. They've treated me well. I recommend them to people all the time. Uh, they're not perfect, but you know most credit unions are pretty good. Matador Credit Union down in uh, the Valley is good. Uh, there, there's uh, the uh, Entertainment Credit Union is pretty good. Uh, do business with all of them. Uh, I've had people in trouble with all of them. And they're all very easy to work with. Except those of you who are unfortunate enough to have GAIN, G-A-I-N, the GAIN Federal Credit Union. They get our honorable mention because GAIN is, they, well, first of all, they don't return phone calls either, which makes it very difficult to deal with them. They don't do things in a timely fashion, which makes it very difficult to deal with them. And they treat their own members extraordinarily poorly. We have a client right now who's in Canyon Country, if you guys are listening, hi, uh, I told you I'd talk about this, who, uh, those of you who listen know that there is a program out there that I promote a lot called the California Mortgage Relief Program. It's run by Cal Halfa, and it's the result of the American Rescue Plan. California got a billion dollars, that's billion with a B, out of the, out of the uh, American Rescue Plan from the Biden administration that is going directly to uh, people who have mortgages in default. So if you've had a mortgage that is more than two months behind before, I think it's August of this year, you can qualify and they will bring your mortgage current. And it is free money. Let me say that again. It is free money. You do not pay them back. So you just qualify, you do a thing online, it's pretty easy. It's one of the best federal, uh, or state rather, run agencies I have ever had the pleasure of working with. And I can tell you personally, they've gotten a lot of people, they've they've made their lives better. They got them out of foreclosure, they saved the house. Uh, I'm so very taken with them. Uh, They've they've gone through about three quarters of the money and the program probably won't last another six months. Uh, But we've had it now for the last year and a half and it's been working great. Gain refuses to participate in that program. It costs the bank nothing. It's free money to the bank as well because it's their, it's their debt that's getting paid and it saves the homeowner and saves the house, keeps that out of foreclosure. Gain will not participate. Not only will Gain not participate, they won't tell us why they're refusing to participate. Maybe there's a good reason. I don't know. But every other bank we have dealt with over the last year and a half, every single one that we have said, hey, you guys aren't participating. You really should get into this program. They participate. They jump in. Why wouldn't they? It's money going to the bank, but not Gain. Gain Federal Credit Union will not do that. 
They're just they're going to do their own thing. And sorry if you happen to have a mortgage with Gain, uh, even though if you had it with B of A or with Wells Fargo or even with even with Gregory Funding, you could qualify for that uh, for that uh, that more that program that relief program. And it, again, it is free money that will save your house, but not if you have your mortgage with Gain. So those of you who have a mortgage with them, I'm sorry. Those of you who belong to that credit union, leave. They're awful. They treat their own clientele. They treat their own membership horribly. There are better credit unions out there. Uh, I wouldn't be a member after what I went through with this one client. I wouldn't have anything to do with those people. I think Gain is a poorly run bank, or credit union rather. I think they're poorly run. I think they treat their people horribly. And that's why they get the honorable mention, second place, if you will, for bad bank of the year. My God, even Gregory Funding, our bad bank of the year winner, even they participate in that program, but Gain won't. So there you go. If you got your loan with Gain or if you got your loan through Gregory Funding, I feel for you. Give me a call. We'll see if we can help you fix that. I will introduce you to some people who can because if you haven't had a problem, great, but you're going to at some point because you cannot reasonably service 25,000 loans and $5 billion worth of mortgages with 31 employees. That, that's nonsense. That's just Gregory Funding's, Funding's model and it's a joke. It just is. Not a very funny joke, but it's a joke nonetheless. So there you go. Bad bank of the year, Gregory funding, honorable mention to good people at, uh, maybe not so good people at gain, the gain credit union. Uh, we, you know, one of the pleasures of this show is I get to expose these things because when you are a financial institution and you treat one of my clients badly, you're going to hear about it. You're going to hear about it, not just from me. You're going to hear about it from the listeners of the show. You're going to hear about it from every mountaintop I can shout it from, because I think as a public, we have all had enough. We've had enough of unscrupulous mortgage banks. 2008, 2009 should have taught us who these people are and what they do, and it has not materially changed. Now, what drives me crazy about this is any bank that comes out and actually chooses to make themselves truly customer-centric, and I don't just mean lip service to it, truly does it, would, cl- would, wop- would wipe up the industry. Because we all hate the mortgage banks. We all know they're bad at this. We all know that if they get an opportunity to take your money, they're going to do it. We all know if you're in a situation that requires compassion, you're not going to get it. We all know how bad this industry is. So anyone who actually came into the industry with honest goals could make a fortune. But until that great day dawns, I guess it's just too profitable being horrible. And I think we've had enough of it. So those of you who have Gregory funding, to those of you at Gain, get away from these companies. They're horrible. You're better off with Wells Fargo who steals from you than these guys. They're just absolutely awful. Anyway, so let's spend the rest of the show talking about zombie mortgages. That'll be fun. We're going to talk about zombie mortgages the rest of the show uh, because that has really come roaring back. Not a surprise as the ice has thawed in the real estate industry a little bit compared to last year and prices are still up and they're getting a little bit softer over time. Uh, the banks are coming at it with a vengeance. The, the straight up banks, the bottom feeders, the, the sorry, I should call them bottom feeders. I should call them, um, what should we call them? Bad debt buyers, I think is what they like to be called. Yeah, maybe I'll stick with bottom feeders. Anyway, um, they're all coming out of the woodwork and they're getting aggressive as you can possibly imagine. I had a client on the way in today tell me, send me a copy of an, a, a notice of sale that was just posted on the 91st day. So they are right on it. Uh, no leeway whatsoever. Or like in the Howard's case where they demanded to be paid by Christmas. I mean, they are just just getting vicious. So we're going to talk a bit about mortgage, about zombie mortgages. But first, let's go to some of our, uh, our uh, uh, sponsors. Let's hear from the sponsors. Let's run the commercials. Let's do all that kind of stuff. When we come back, it's going to be zombie mortgages for the rest of the show. And you'll, I'll tell you what they are. I'll tell you how to defeat them. I'll tell you how we fight them. And I'll tell you how to check to see if you got one. So um, first part of the show, fun part. Second part of the show, a little more serious. But uh, please listen, because people don't check their credit, and they do not check their title. And if you don't do those things, you may have a zombie mortgage. You may not know about it until they come to take your house. So please listen. I'm Rich Sherman. You've been listening to The Real Estate Fix. We'll be back after this. Hi, guys. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening through the break. Welcome back. You've reached The Real Estate Fix. With, I'm your host, Rich Sherman. That's why I call the show The Real Estate Fix with Rich on KHTS, uh, AM, AM 1220, FM 98.1, your hometown station. And thank you guys for tuning in. Hey, during the break, producer, engineer, uh, and with whom we could not do the show, Jen, was asking a very intelligent question uh, about Bad Bank of the Year. Uh, hard to ask an intelligent question when I'm goofing around about Bad Bank of the Year. What she asked was, how can this be allowed? And that's a very reasonable question, one I think we should cover a little bit. Uh, Gregory Funding and uh, Gain, they're, they're, one's a credit union, one's a bank, or one's a mortgage service, or I should say. They're regulated slightly differently by slightly different agencies, but ultimately, the ultimate arbiter of this is supposed to be, the ultimate watchdog is supposed to be the CFPB, the unfortunately named Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, which is a federal bureau. The CFPB is supposed to be to consumer debt, uh, mortgages, student loans, credit cards, that sort of thing, what the SEC is to stocks. They're supposed to be the ultimate watchdog. Uh, they were they were chartered by Elizabeth Warren. Really got the group up and going. They were start they were chartered in 2008, 2009, and they've had trouble with funding. Congress has tried to shut them down over and over again. I'll let you guess as to which political which side of the political aisle has a problem with them. 
uh, are the bigger problem with them because they get, they get flack from both. But they are ultimately the regulatory agency. The problem is the CFPB these days is in a position where they just take cumulative data. So if enough people complain to the CFPB about Gregory funding, then at some point the CFPB will take action. But that doesn't help the individual homeowner. You know, you lost your house two years ago because you couldn't get Gregory funding on the phone even though you spent your home a week, eight hours a day trying to get them and you still couldn't get them, which is a true story. Um, sorry, doesn't help you. But one day they might get around to finding uh, Gregory funding for their bad behavior and their unbelievably poor customer service. So that's the answer to the question is everybody seems to be asleep at the switch. That's the answer to a lot of this. If the CFP, CFPB were properly funded and given uh, proper personnel, they could fix this. They could fix it on a federal level. On the state level, there are attorneys general. There are all sorts of people who could be doing stuff with this. They just don't. Most of the problems that we have in the mortgage industry that I scream about every day all come down to the same thing. And we're going to talk about this with zombie mortgages for sure. Lack of political will. That's what it all comes down with. All comes down to. The reason that the Howards are in the trouble that they're in, the reason that zombie mortgages exist, because we're going we're gonna to go over this today and you're going to see what a blight these things are and how ridiculous they are and how frankly insulting it is to be in California compared to other states on this topic. But it's all for one reason, P lack of political will. Every politician I talk to is aware of zombie mortgage. They all know it's a problem. They all know it's a scourge. The problem is there's not enough political will to fix it. And until some politician somewhere decides that they're going to take this on, and in this case, it needs to be state, it needs to be somebody in state office. So if you're listening out there, any one of you guys, this is a great issue. I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to come to your office and give you chapter and verse. Or I'll do it over the phone, whatever you need. But I've talked to every politician I can find, and I've been doing this for the better part of 20 years, and nobody seems to want to take up this cause because, gee, I guess it's too bad you lost your house. Yes, we could have done something about it. Yes, the laws in California are perverted to the point that they're almost impossible to believe. But uh, I don't know, it's not as popular as something else. Again, that old maxim, no politician has ever lost their job for doing nothing. You lose your job as a politician for doing something that's not popular. And that is very true and very sad, and that's why we're in this mess. So let's talk about zombie mortgages a little bit. There's a great article by Forbes in October that I would encourage everybody to read. So I'm going to read you some excerpts from it because they, they do a pretty good job of giving you a concise here. Uh, what is a zombie mortgage? A zombie mortgage is, in the simplest terms, a mortgage that the borrower thought was either erased or already paid off that has suddenly come back to life. That's why we call them zombies. Sometimes they're referred to as ghosts, but I like, I like zombie mortgages better. It's more accurate, I think. Uh, zombie mortgages are an unfortunate vestige of the 2007-2009 recession where unscrupulous lenders were Marketing or were marketing predatory high interest rate loans to vulnerable, often low income communities, often communities that are of color or do not speak English, uh, who found themselves suddenly underwater. When homeowners are underwater, the outstanding balance they are paying on their mortgage is more than the property's market value. Around 12 million homes faced foreclosures during those years. Some homeowners saved their homes by accepting things like a piggyback mortgage or an 80-20 loan, which unbeknownst to them was actually two separate mortgages on a single property, one that covered 80% of the loan and the other that covered 20% of the loan. Country Road was famous for putting these out there. They had a very popular 80-20 program, so zero down, you'd buy a house. And this is where, where one of the reasons it manifests, one of the reasons country is not around anymore. The terms of these loans were undesirable, often with interest rates that approached 10% or more and with huge balloon payments. Over the next few years, the values of the homes continued to decrease and lenders found it difficult to collect payments for those smaller uh, second loans. Consequently, many of the original lenders wrote them off or sold the loans and got out of the lending business entirely. Uh, GMAC used to be the fifth biggest lender in the country. They do not do mortgage loans anymore. They left after 2009-10. Because of these exits, many homeowners stopped hearing about the second loan entirely. For years, no one sent them statements or demanded payment. So that's what a zombie mortgage is, a mortgage that you thought was gone because of a bankruptcy or because of a loan mod or maybe because you thought you, thought you, you paid it off, whatever, or maybe you just thought it was gone because they stopped talking to you about it. But it doesn't work that way. What causes zombie mortgages? Usually bad advice or misunderstood advice. We see them most often after a previous loan modification that the homeowner mistakenly thinks has in uh, included both their first and second loans. If you had an 80-20 from Countrywide, and B of A got most of their assets, so in 2008-9, Countrywide went out of business, and you, your loan suddenly went to, country, went to B of A, and you went to B of A and you asked them to please uh, give you a loan modification, they, may have, they probably did modify your first, but they didn't touch your second. And they may have said something like, you need to worry about the second. Um, or you filed a bankruptcy, same deal. I see people who get bad bankruptcy advice all the time. My bankruptcy attorney told me many years ago that by doing this chapter seven, I didn't have to worry about the second. Well, wrong. That is just bad advice. A chapter seven bankruptcy does not discharge a second mortgage. Sorry. Um, they're, they're, 
many, many, many things. But it is almost never the case that a loan mod modification will include more than one loan, regardless of their multiple loans with the same servicer. So if you had a first and a second, you still have a first and a second, even after a modification. Sometimes homeowners get letters in the mail telling them that the second mortgage has been charged off and no further payments are necessary. We've had several clients who have these letters. Charged off, no payments are necessary. However, being charged off does not mean the same to a mortgage servicer it does to everyone else. What it means is the bank has told the federal government and the state franchise tax board that the debt is no longer collectible and of no value. That's what a charge off is. That's the definition of the IRS. No longer collectible and of no value. Please give us a tax write-off. No problem. Then the servicer turns around and sells the charged off loan for a discounted value, usually 20 to 60% of the loan's pre-zombie value. In other words, you have a $100,000 loan that hasn't been paid for five, six years uh, with, I don't know, whoever, Bank of America. Bank of America turns around and sells that loan for $20,000 to SLS or to uh, West Coast Collections or, you know, any of these other, any players, PHH, any other players in this, Gregory Funding, any other players who do this sort of thing, uh, these bad debt buyers. And so for $20,000, they picked up a $100,000 debt. Now, when that bad debt buyer looks at it and goes, well, let's see, you owe $300,000 on your first, there's a $100,000 second I'm now holding in my hand that you haven't touched for five years, and your house is worth $600,000. Guess what? Payday for me. Because what I'm going to do as the, as the uh, bad debt buyer is I um, will have paid $20,000 for $100,000 debt. I'm going to do the math and say, well, this was a 9% loan at $100,000. Uh, it's been five years or more you now owe us $200,000. And then I'm going to send a letter to the homeowner and say, please give us $200,000 in the next 90 days or we're going to take your house. And everything I just described to you while being unethical and immoral is 100% legal. They bought that loan, remember, in my example, for 20 grand, 20% of a $100,000 face value. Now they're attempting to enforce the total value of the loan, $100,000, plus whatever fees and back whatever has been tagged onto it. So you're looking at much, much higher. It's usually two to three times what was originally owed, depending on the length of the debt and the interest rate. Uh, the interest rates are high to begin with. So now all of a sudden you're the homeowner. You've been paying down your debt for the last five years, in my example, or longer. So now you owe less on the house. And God willing, it's wonderful. The equity position has also gone up because your house is worth more than you paid for it five years ago because the last five years have been pretty good. So your house is worth more and you owe less. And all you've done is make yourself a bigger target to that second because now there's meat on that bone. And they're going to foreclose on you without a second thought. So... What can you do if somebody calls you about a more contacts you about a zombie loan? First, I strongly advise against ignoring the communication. Do not ex uh, uh, ignore a bank or, or other collection agency contacting you about a former loan. Whether they're right, wrong, or indifferent, do not ignore it. You've got to get in front of this training because it will run you over. You should demand that party validates the debt and provide evidence of the amounts claimed and due and owing. You should retain a good attorney. This is where it gets pricey because a decent real estate attorney is to, to, to get through a case like this is going to, it's going to cost you five to 10 grand or more. That's just what it's going to cost. A good real estate attorney is going to charge you three to 500 bucks an hour. And they're going to charge your retainer up front of anywhere between two to 5,000 bucks. That's where I come in. I know that gap exists because my wife is a real estate attorney. Hi, honey. Uh, is a real estate attorney and a darn good one. And she takes an awful lot of uh, pro bono cases. Uh, she, please don't call me. She's at capacity now. I probably shouldn't have said that on the air. But uh, she does a lot of that sort of stuff. And very early on in our careers, uh, you know, in the, in the early 90s, we sort of discovered that there were all sorts of people who needed help that couldn't afford it. You know, and the concept of the laws that we all subscribe to in this country, one of the wonderful things about the laws in this country and the way we structure them is the idea is we are all equal under the law. That's what it says on the freezer of the Supreme Court Latin. We are all equal under the law. There is no asterisk that says for those who can afford it. But that seems to be the way things work these days. So we stepped into that breach. I stepped into that breach because I'm not an attorney. It seems to come up a lot these days. Um, I am not an attorney. I know a lot about this stuff because there's a lot of practical knowledge with it. But I do it for free. I'll step into the breach and go to war over a zombie mortgage. And I do it for free. And I've been doing it that way for almost 30 years. And it's served us very well. It's very simple. We follow a pay-it-forward business model. We help people out. We get you out of foreclosure. We solve your problem if we possibly can. We do it totally for free, and we hope that you'll come back to us at some point and buy or sell a house with us. And the money we make buying and selling houses, like regular real, the regular real estate stuff, quote unquote, is the money we use to run the company. It's not hard to figure out. It's just what we do, and it works really well for us. Pay it forward business model. So uh, a lot of people used to do that. You know, uh, uh, big companies, Apple Computer, guys, like they they run that same sort of uh, business model for a lot of what they do. Um, but most people don't, unfortunately. That's a, an idea that sort of went the, the way of the dodo in the last couple of years. But we still do it. So yeah, so get a good attorney. It's a good way to do it. Call us. We can help you out. Uh, but right away, first things you need to do. First things you need to do uh, when you talk to them is you need to double check the accuracy of the claim. Uh, 
According to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, a government agency that ensures the banks, lenders, and other financial companies treats citizens fairly, you should not automatically assume you are liable for the debt someone calls you about. That's the CFPB. That's what we were talking about. Um, that's, that, is, that is who you need to talk to. What did I lose here? Huh. Anyway, the CFPB is who you need to talk to for that, their advice on this. They're the ones who should be riding shotgun on this and to be overlooking all of this, and they just aren't doing it at the moment, or it's not the way they should be. So if you, have, uh, if you get contacted by a zombie second or any junior death that they contact you, the first thing you need to do is double-check the accuracy of the claim. What does that mean? You generally have the right to ask a debt collector about the debt, including if you don't believe you owe the debt. If you owe, if, according to the CFPB, uh, if your right to ask for uh, notification in writing that includes all of the valid information, which includes, according to the CFPB, should include anyway, the amount of the debt, you'd call them, you'd send them a, it's called a qualified written request in California. It just means you put it in writing. Here's what you want to know. The amount of the debt, the name of the creditor that you, that you supposedly owe, a description of your rights under the Federal Fair Debt Collections Practices Act, you can force them to tell you that. Uh, check to see whether the, de the debt they're trying to collect is time barred. Has, there are time limits. There was just recent guidance from the CAPB that says, lenders, if you try to collect on a time barred debt, a debt that you're no longer allowed to collect on because time has run out, you get all kinds of fines and penalties, which is great in other places, but in California is all but meaningless. And I'll tell you why. And this is one of our major problems with the law in California. And this is why zombie seconds are so freaking popular in California and so, so incredibly profitable for the people who do this. It has to do with the statute of limitations. Um, California, there are two types of foreclosures. There's judicial and non-judicial. California is what's called a non-judicial state, which means that the vast majority, I'm going to guess 99% of the residential foreclosures in California are done where the court just stamps it. They don't actually have a case in the court. They do it kind of through the court, next to the court, if you will, rather than actually through the court. And the reason for that is judicial foreclosures take three to five years. Non-judicial foreclosures take about four months and are a lot cheaper. So let's compare other states. In Florida, they have a five-year statute of limitations. In other words, if you default in 2020 and they make no attempt to come after you by 2025, five years have passed, you're good to go. They cannot foreclose on you. Now, there's a lot more to it. And there are loopholes in it for sure. Um, so I'll go calling all your relatives in Florida and say, hey, if you don't pay, that's not the case. But in general, five years from the default if the, in Florida, if the bank doesn't come after you, they got a problem coming after you. New York, New York State, six years from the acceleration foreclosure filing. If they start a foreclosure in New York and they do not complete it within six years, which is kind of ridiculous, obviously it's going to be done within six years, but if they don't, and there's at least one very famous case where Wells Fargo didn't, they cannot foreclose. Now, when you die, they can get the house back, but they cannot foreclose on the house. So in California, for non-judicial foreclosures, and remember what I told you about us being a non-judicial uh, case, non-judicial state, the law says it is supposed to be six years for judicial foreclosures. So if a bank choose to come out, chooses to come after you for a judicial, a judicial foreclosure and they don't get it done within six years, they can't do it, which sounds pretty good. Except here's the rub. Because we're a non-judicial state, the statute of limitations for non-judicial foreclosures is anywhere from 10 years to 60 years, depending on how the loan is written. And I'm here to promise you, every one of these loans is written at the 60-year term. It has to do with what the dates they put in the actual note itself, or I should say the, uh, the deed itself. Uh, so it's 60 years. So if, you, if a bank doesn't come after you in California for 60 years, well, then you got yourself a case. Now, I've been doing this for 30 years. So I've, I've been doing mortgage defense for people for free for 30 years, foreclosure defense. And I have never, not once, not ever, seen a 60-year-old mortgage debt. Never seen it. So I doubt you're going to run into that in California. Why does California work this way? Well, let's see. The law was six years uh, from, for a judicial foreclosure. But yet the law was altered, probably before it was ever voted in, into uh, practice to begin with, that it can be up to 60 years if the note is written, if the deed is written a certain way. So you nullify, and the banks aren't stupid, so what they do is they nullify the meaning of the law, the purpose of the initial law, which is to limit it to six years, which would be much more in line with Florida, New York, and other states in the country, and in California, is 60 years because we're special. That's why zombie mortgages exist here. Uh, the Howard's debt which we've been talking about. They have not made a payment. They have not heard a word from anybody in over a dozen years. If they were in Florida, the bank could have a hard time, SLS would have a hard time collecting on this debt. In California, no problem. No problem. We can send you a letter today. Four months from now, we can own your house here at SLS. If you don't pay us, in that case, the roughly 500,000 they were asking for and the 63,000 they were asking for up front as part of a ridiculous modification. 
Uh, that's the problem in California. The laws in California, I don't know if they're written by the banks. I don't know if it's because the politicians involved are just paid off by the banks. And when I say paid off, I don't mean anything illicit. It can just be, con- you know, Wells Fargo sponsors you as your candidacy. You're not going to piss off Wells Fargo if you want to keep your job. Uh, I don't know if it's just, you know, somebody's asleep at the switch. Maybe the politicians don't have mortgages. Maybe they're just, I don't know, were kicked in the head by a horse when they're all young and they're just dumb. I don't know. But what I do know is to have a 60-year statute of limitations on collections of junior liens is obscene. It's wrong. It's silly. Anyone who knows anything about this will tell you, oh, California, that's just the dumbest thing ever. Foreclosure defense in California as a result of this nonsense, of this 60-year nonsense on zombie seconds, is harder than almost any other state in the country, with the possible exception of Texas. It's ridiculous. 60-year statute of limitations. If you if you if you can tell me how that's acceptable, please please call me up and let me know because I am confused by that. That to me seems like a gift to the banking industry. That seems like a gift to the mortgage servicing industry, and it seems like a giant gift to the bad debt collections ag- uh, uh, agencies that get out there, like your West Coast collections and sorry West Coast servicing now guys like that. Um, these guys they buy these debts for pennies on the dollar, and then they seek to enforce the whole thing. And if you got equity in your house, you got a problem. So be aware. So you should also ask for an accounting. Let's get back to the other things you need to get from the bank. You should ask the bank for it. So again, ask for the amount of the debt, ask the name of the creditor, get a description of your rights from the bank under the Fair Debt Collections Practices Act. Uh, Fair Debt Collections Practices Act. I'm going to bump again. Uh, check to see if you're time barred. You're not if it's California in most cases, 99%. Uh, you should also ask for an accounting of the loan going back to its inception. That's something you have a right to. Give us an accounting of the loan back to the day I took it out. And often when the when loan goes from bank A to bank B to bank C, they lose records. We had one recently had a 14-year gap, and they just sent us the records. Oh, there's just a 14-year gap. We've, we've worked it out. No. No, you can't do that. You have a 14-year gap in your records. doesn't mean your loan's uncollectible, but it does mean we're going to cut a deal. And it does mean you guys are going to be very amenable to cutting a deal because if you don't, the client will go to court and you'll lose. You cannot have a 14-year gap in mortgage records and still claim the full amount owed. Can't do that. So yeah, get an get an accounting going back to the loan's inception. These are all things we do in my office for clients, all part of the free stuff we do. You should also ask for a copy of the note and the deed of trust. And the deed of trust you can get online through the assessor's office or through a title company. The note you have to get from the bank. Uh, you should ask for all assignments and notices of assignments. Whoever has that zombie second now, it's gone through a couple of hands to get there. And if they did not process the assignments properly, they cannot collect. So again, amount of the debt, who do you owe, description of your rights, check to see if it's time barred. You should ask for an accounting going back to the inception of the loan, see if there's any reversible uh, uh, mistakes there. Uh, ask for a copy of the note and the deed of, the, and the deed of trust, because sometimes the note has issues in it as well. It's rare, but it does happen. And ask for all assignments and notices of assignments between when you took out that loan and this current bank has it. In other words, prove that I owe you this money. Prove that you have the ability to collect. Don't just prove to me you bought the debt. Prove to me you have the ability. Because the problem with notices is they need not be constructive, which means that the bank doesn't have to prove they sent them to you. And that's the problem with notices like that. So... The, other, the next best thing to do is you check under the Fair Debt Collections Practices Act to see what you have there. So I tell you what, we're going to talk all about the Fair Debt Collections Practices Act. We're going to talk about RESPA and we're going to talk about TILA. These are the guidelines, the little initials you need to take a look at. If you're in that situation, these are things we live with every day. We'll talk about that when we get back. And I'll calm down a little bit because I'm really pissed that California allowed this 60-year statute of limitations. It's crazy. Absolutely insane. Most of the mortgages are only 30 years long. Totally nuts. Anyway, please listen to the, to, through the uh, through the break here. When we come back, we're going to talk about more about zombie uh, zombie mortgages and how to fight them off. Hi guys, thank you for listening through the break. Welcome back. I'm your host Rich Sherman. You've reached the Real Estate Fix on KHTS 98.1 AM 1220, your hometown station. And thank you guys for tuning in. Thank you for hanging in through the break. Uh, we're just going through some of the stuff you need to do if you get hit with a zombie mortgage. Uh, what a zombie mortgage is, and some of the ridiculous laws in California that are only in California, like the 60-year statute of limitations on collecting on a zombie debt. Um, so yes, yeah, so let's get back into it. So if you qualify for relief under the, if you do qualify for relief, uh, the Fair Debt Collections Practices Act is where you want to start. And I'll even give you a heads up. You want to look at Regulation F in the Fair Debt Collections Practices Act, FDCPA, the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. Uh, and that'll tell you a lot of what you need to know as far as how to defend yourself. And being able to quote these things to your bank when you talk to them scares the heck out of the banks. That's good too. Um, the other two, the other two things you want to look at, three things you want to look at real quickly is TILA, the Truth in Lending, uh, um, uh, uh, what's the A stand for? Agreement? No. Agency? Uh, anyway, TILA. And you want to look at um, the uh, uh, RESPA, the Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act. 
those two laws you want to read through, and you can read synopsis of them. So again, Fair Debt Collections Practices Act, TILA, RESPA, and last but not least, the Homeowner Bill of Rights. Now, the Homeowner Bill of Rights is something near and dear to my heart because we had a little bit to do with getting it started and, and getting uh, certain uh, things added to it as time went on. We were nice to, a couple of politicians were nice enough to ask us to consult on that in uh, 2005, 6, and 7, and the act that finally took place in 2008, 9, and 10. Uh, the Homeowner Bill of Rights is specifically designed to allow homeowners to get assistance from their mortgage servicer. So there are rights that the servicer has to give you to a loan modification into certain forms of foreclosure defense under the Homeowner Bill of Rights. So that's where you want to look. Uh, again, Fair Debt Collections Practices Act, TILA, oh, Truth in Lending Act, A. TILA, the uh, TILA, RESPA, so Fair Debt Collections Practices Act, TILA, RESPA, T-I-L-A, R-E-S-P-A, and H-B-O-R, the H-Board. So those are the four. And if you want those, again, just give me a call and I'll be happy to share them with you. It's, it's no big deal. I, I live and die with these things all the time, which is why it was embarrassing. I couldn't remember the A and TILA stood for ACT. Anyway, um, and you see if they violate any of the guidelines there because your best defense against a zombie second or any sort of zombie lien, or even with, if you're in default on a first lien for that matter, I say this on a daily basis, you've got to find a way to put their debt under threat because the laws, especially on zombies, they favor the collection agency. They do not favor the homeowner, and that's my problem with them because it's way too easy to take somebody's house um, under these circumstances. Uh, so yeah, that's what you look at. You look at what, you can, what, what is your defense? The best defense, as they say, is a good offense. How you build a good offense is you look at these things. You look at the Fair Debt Collections Practice Act. You demand the records from them. You look at what, to, what time barred means in your area, in your state. Uh, you look at, at uh, TILA and RESPA. You look at HBOR and you see if they violate any of those. And I promise you, if you dig deep enough, you will find they violated them. Now, whether that gets you to the point where you need to sue the bank or it makes sense to do that, that's a whole other conversation. And it usually doesn't because of the costs involved and the time involved. Another problem with our legal system in California. But it does mean you can bring it up to the bank and you can use that as leverage to get a better deal out of the bank. You can leverage a bank away from foreclosing. That's what we're doing for the Howard family now uh, and for lots and lots of others. But it all comes down to the same thing. How do we put their debt under threat? At the end of the day, that's what, that's what gets it done. How do we put their debt under threat? So at the end, it, I'll, just, I'll just tell you this. The most important thing to do in facing a zombie mortgage, as we've just been talking about, is to face it and attack it before it has a chance to attack you, before it has a chance to take your home. The longer you delay, think about this, the longer you delay in doing something about that zombie mortgage, the stronger their position comes becomes and the weaker your position becomes. Every single day that clock is ticking toward foreclosure, the closer you get to foreclosure, the worse it is for you and the better it is for them. I had, a client, I had a client I talked to today. He wasted two weeks. He wasn't sure what he wanted to do. He had some, to figure it out. And the two weeks, he, two weeks he wasted are now probably going to force him into a bankruptcy that could have otherwise likely been avoided. We'll still save his house. We'll still get it worked out. It's just going to be a little bit more expensive, a little more time consuming, a little annoying for the client because he's probably going to have to file a bankruptcy. We'll refer him to a good bankruptcy attorney. We use Lou Esmond. He's fantastic. I recommend him most highly. Um, so Lou's probably going to wind up with him. But we'll, and we'll get the house saved and we'll do it through the bankruptcy. We'll do it in a concert with that. But had he not wasted those two, it was just two weeks. Had he not wasted those two weeks, unfortunately, probably wouldn't have had to file the bankruptcy and incur the cost and the credit damage the bankruptcy is going to cause. So yeah, do not delay. Do not ignore. Time is never on your side. And the one thing I can promise you, this is not going to go away by itself. You are a target. If a zombie second is coming after you, if a collection agent is coming after you, it's because they have decided you are a target. Maybe they're wrong, maybe they're right, I don't know, but they've made you a target. And they're not going to go away. They see you as a payday. Just know that. Do not delay. Contact me, contact an attorney, contact somebody, but do not delay. That is the single most important thing. If you are having trouble with one of these things, please give me a call. You can reach me. I'm at 661-714-1400, and you can reach me at that number 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, it's funny, last week, we had, I got managed to get one day off last week, and I went to Magic Mountain, and while my daughter and I were standing in line for Colossus, I was returning people's uh, calls who were in foreclosure. Uh, we did some good, too. It was fun. Uh, it's a pretty fun place to work if you're standing in line at Colossus, if you have the opportunity to do so. Because at the end, you get to go on Colossus. But uh, yeah, so 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you can reach me. Again, 661-714-1400. And my name again is Rich Sherman, and I'm with Radius Agent, and uh, that's who I am. And I've been doing this for 30 years, and I'll be happy to help you. But before we wrap up the show, I just want to do one little thing, one little last thing. A little bit of a personal thing, if you guys will indulge me a little bit. Uh, we had a client uh, recently. Um, you guys may have read, read her story named Beverly Fox. And Beverly was Beverly was a unique individual. She was in her 90s. She told everyone she was 90. She was really 91. I don't know why you'd squeeze the one year, but it made her happy. And at that age, tell you people whatever age you want to be. Uh, and she was being taken advantage of. She was being put into foreclosure by an unscrupulous uh, lender with a, uh, 
reverse mortgage. We're going to talk about reverse mortgages a bit more next week. But uh, the lender is PHH, and their game is a lot of the reverse mortgages. The game is they decided she was dead when she was very much alive. Because she was dead, according to them, they put the house into foreclosure. We said, no, no, she's very much alive. And they said, okay. And they reversed the foreclosure, but they left all the foreclosure fees, about five to $10,000 they were charging her, and just garbage fees. And that's the game with reverse mortgages, because when somebody dies, you don't necessarily know what the fees were on their house. You just know they had a reverse mortgage. But we got in it. We got it fixed. And like I said, we'll talk about that next week. Now, unfortunately, I just got the news yesterday that about a week ago, uh, Beverly passed away. She is no longer with us. So uh, if you're curious, the story is still out there. KHTS did a fantastic story. The news, uh, news uh, uh, division here, uh, Jay and Manchin and those guys did a fantastic story about her uh, last year. And that story was what we were able to use to get her out of foreclosure and get her money get back to her. So it was a little bit easier for her and get her, her checks reinstated and stuff. So Beverly, wherever you are, uh, wherever you have gone, you are missed. You were, you were extraordinary. It was a pleasure to work for you. It was an honor to work for you. And it was a pleasure to get to know you. And I was very, very sorry that uh, that you are no longer with us. I feel we've all been somewhat diminished by her passing. So uh, those of your family who may listen to the show, um, let us know that we're thinking about her, let you know that we're thinking about her. And she's an extraordinary person. And uh, we all miss her very much. It was, it, was, it was a pleasure to work for her. We were proud to work for her. It was our honor to work for her. And she was an extraordinary person, a lot of fun to know. Um, and uh, yeah, we all miss her very much. So fairly well, Beverly Fox. We hope wherever you've gone, it's better than this. And we hope you're doing well. So I hope, you, so hope you're looking down on us now. But I wanted to make a little mention of her because she was fantastic and she is missed. So well, with that, I think we'll wrap up the show. We are changing the format with the show a little bit. I'm not doing it weekly. We're going to start doing it every two weeks because there's just too much stuff coming into my office that just needed my direct attention. And as much as I love being on the radio, and as much as I love doing this show, and I do, it's a lot of fun for me. Hope it's a lot of fun for you guys who are listening. I uh, hope it's informative more than that. Uh, but uh, we are going to change it up a little bit because I just cannot do it every week anymore. I just can't. So we're going to be doing it twice a month. The first and third Fridays of the month, I will be here. So, uh, and you can always get it on YouTube and stuff like that. And more importantly, you can always get me anytime you want. Call me, 661-714-1400. I will be back on the 19th, I think it is, Friday the 19th. And um, the next show, we're going to be talking about zombie, not about, excuse me, zombie mortgages was today. We're going to be talking about uh, reverse mortgages. I'll be bringing an expert and talking about all sorts of stuff. So thank you guys for listening. It is a pleasure. Have a good couple of weeks. I'll be back on the 19th and uh, have a good two weeks. Be good humans. I'll see you then. Thanks. I'm your host, Rich Sherman. You guys have a good, uh, good couple of weeks.